Ladies and gentlemen, for me as British Ambassador, it is a huge honour to be welcoming you all, and especially Commission Vice President Cruz, to the British residents. And I think the most important thing I should do is speak quickly, because what you really want to do is hear from the, com from the, from the Commission Vice President. But let me say three things. The first one, and as you look, it's important as you look around the grand surroundings, is about the British residents. Because those of you who are thinking, how can austerity Britain manage to refurbish this wonderful residence? Let me reassure you, this is a shared residence. It's used by all the diplomatic missions here. We funded it because we've disposed of other residences. And we want to use it as a platform, a platform for business, and for discussion. And it's absolutely wonderful that this historic building, which we have brought into the 21st century by installing Wi-Fi wi in, its, in, its, in its recent refurbishment, should be hosting this webinar. The second point is about big data. Two recent conversations I've had with pharmaceutical companies, and it's not just about health, but health is an area which obviously attracts a lot of attention. One says to me, in the future, it could be that our biggest competition will be from, data, from search engines. This isn't a competition comment. This is about what's happening in science. A second says to me, you do not realize what we can do with the data we have found in one global university for research in the UK. The data on the effects of a certain gene on a particular population pool, which will allow us to tackle a chronic disease. So mining data, and it's not just about mining, but let's just talk about mining data, that is a fantastic opportunity for us, for our prosperity in Europe, for our quality of life, for the richness of our science. And we need to get this right. We need to get the regulatory climate right, we need to get the right balance between protection, because we recognize the legitimate concerns about access to data, and opportunities. And we in the UK, we see this as a great opportunity. And my science minister, David Willits, recently identified as big data as one of eight global technologies that we should be seizing. Third, and finally, something about the UK. Science business, and I should thank Dwayne and his team for putting this event together today. They said, well, as British ambassador, just tell them about the wonderful things you're doing in the UK. Well, let me reassure you, I think there are enough British distinguished participants in the audience today, you do not need a lot of propaganda from the British ambassador. But I will say one thing, which is how important it is for us in the UK to host events like this. How important it us that we should be giving you a platform for an open discussion about some how to make Europe better and more competitive. Because we in the UK absolutely support, and I think I speak for many people here, not just from the UK, what the Commission Vice President is doing. How important it is for the historical point in our economy at a time when we need confidence and optimism about what we can do in Europe. And we, and you may read a lot about the debate about Europe in the UK, we want very much to be at the heart of the debate about making Europe more competitive. And I hope that will be something we'll be able to do today. So without further ado, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to hand over to the Commission Vice President, Madam Crows. Good afternoon, everybody. I was just wondering when um, the ambassador was so kindly explaining why here he, as a representative of the government of the UK, why he is organizing this. And indeed, that would be the best line you could take home if we take uh, the line of the ambassador we need to get it right, and if you allow me to just add to that, as soon as possible and not losing time. 
for it's not only a matter of a better Europe, very important, by the way, better for everybody, so for all the citizens, but also just pushing our competitiveness. And pushing our competitiveness is, in a global scene, quite a challenging uh, issue. And that means that we can't lose time, for then we are talking about prosperity, we are talking about a better feeling for all those who are in the category of aging population and what have you. That would be the best line you could take home and I should stop here. But, well, I did get a little bit more time. So um, it is just to get your attention a little bit more. As I speak, the world is generating 1.7 million billion bytes. Yes, I'm saying it right. 1.7 million billion bytes of data per minute. Well, if you can explain it to my granddaughter, you are invited. That is over six megabytes per day for every man, woman and child on the planet. So then we are talking. From instruments, sensors, online transactions, email, video, <laughs> and a host of other digital sources. It is just incredible, and it is nearby out of imagination. But the amazing thing isn't just the amount of data, it is what we can do with it, and what we can do with it today. New advances in machine learning, in data mining, and visualization give us ever more ways to extract ever more useful information from ever larger data sets. And Tim Berners-Lee, you all know who he is. He said, data is a precious thing. And he knew that if you put it online, it will be used by other people to do wonderful things and some not wonderful things in ways that you could never ever imagine. But why is data so valuable? Quite simply, knowledge is the engine of our economy and data is its fuel. And for traditional and service sectors, analytics, processing bring new opportunities, transforming efficiency and productivity. And for the public sector, Better data allows services that are more efficient, are more transparent and more personalized. For scientists, open results and open data allow new ways to share, to compare and discover, permitting whole new fields of research, just what the, what the ambassador was mentioning. And for citizens, data is the key to more information and empowerment, and to new services and applications. Just think about using data to improve internet search engines, to better trace and fight fit illnesses, or to limit road congestion. We are just at the beginning of a paradigm shift. Huge amounts of data are starting to be generated automatically, and we still be able to store to process and analyze those huge amounts. And that can change the way we make decisions and how we run our businesses. Just one example. Siemens fits its machinery with sensors, which generate data about its functioning. So far, so good. So that data is constantly analyzed for any anomalies to defect failures and fatigue in advance, alert service operators up front before the damage occurs. Yeah, and then you are talking. Mitigate the risk of long-term service contracts and increase the efficiency of remote monitoring operations. <laughs> and also benefits of such automatically generated data as opposed to obtained manually by a technician, dispatcher to measure the machine in various ways, 
our undeniable automated generation is still not the norm in industrial production. So how can people like me support that? And I do have the feeling there are a couple of ways. Number one, regulation. It is not the first term I would like to use in this residence, but you sometimes need regulation. We need a set of rules that maximize the value and minimize the cost of data. Making it freely available for reuse and freely flowing across Europe without compromising on fairness, on transparency or user control. And for one thing, as part of our wider open data strategy, we have revised the rules about public sector data. In fact, I expect that revised directive to be finally approved by the EU legislators within a matter of weeks, it will be in June, it will make it way easier to use and reuse public data with lower charges and without complicated conditions for reuse. And secondly, unlocking the data needs people's trust. So we need a data protection framework that builds that confidence and permits that digital innovation. We proposed such a framework back in January 2012, a comprehensive reform to take account of both globalization and the advance of the technology. Because these have massively changed how our data is collected accessed and used. We will make it easier for personal data to cross border without compromising on the high and consistent protection Europeans expect. We will build in principles like privacy by design with safeguards built into new IDs right from birth, plus different interpretations of existing rules currently mean 27 different ways of enf enforcing, so working across borders can be a costly headache. Our proposal does away with that fragmentation. Great, with a single data protection regulation for the whole EU. And that could save business over, and I'm talking about euros, 2 billion a year. So annual base saving 2 billion. Second, it is not just legislation that can support big data. Innovative data products and services need interoperability, standardization, and, where possible, harmonized formats. Otherwise, the data is there in theory, but it is just too difficult to fit together and use in practice, and that's not what we want. And it's that much harder to make new IDs work across borders. So we are working in these areas too. In this respect, the Commission has engaged with stakeholders in the European public sector information ecosystem to forge lightweight agreements and standards that are needed to enable interoperability and integration of public sector information. And we are also promoting standardization of data formats on our EC Open Data Portal. And one of the goals of our pan-European open data portal is to drive the harmonization of data formats and licensing conditions in Europe. Open data standards are also considered in the Commission's fourth research and development project negotiations and are emphasized to continue as a part of Horizon 2020 activities from 2040 awards. Third, public funding can also help open data. For one thing, ladies and gentlemen, we can invest in big data research and innovation. Under our current research program, we have pumped in average 76 million euros a year into data and language technologies and provided Council and Parliament give us adequate budget in Horizon 2020, we intend to continue to fund innovation in the area of data product services from business intelligence and decision support to added value services. And because I want to support a strong European data industry, the companies who can produce and market all this innovation. Some European companies, and I'm just 
that Champagne a couple, Sap, Atos, Telefonica, but a lot more are already established, well known and successful. And already we have many smaller global successes like Good Data for cloud services, Vestas Wine Systems for collection and analysis, DataSift providing real-time intelligence from social, social networks and so on. But not enough. I like to see more and in particular startups with Europe becoming a leading player. The startups are of essential importance in that whole development. Plus, we are investing in research. We can practice what we preach. Open access to scientific results and data is a great way to boost science, boost the economy, and enable new te techniques and collaborations between disciplines. It is quite simple. It is about ensuring you can see the results you have already paid for through your taxes. So let's make that tax money indeed available for that type of development. And we have set up a research data alliance. So scientific data infrastructure can be fully interoperable and so sharing data becomes even simpler. Just closing. Um, it is a little about how I see the open data revolution, if you allow me. Just a little about how we can support it through legislation, standards and research funding. Those three are main. I know we are not alone in seeing this huge economic potential. And it is a big, big potential, so to say. And if we are taking many out of there supporting us, and there's a great competitive market out there to get the maximum value from big data. The competition is a good thing. I'm very positive about competition. It is helping our digital society, by the way. It is helping innovation with new and exciting services available for people every day. And it's good for our economy, giving us a much needed boost at a time of crisis. This is the hope. These are the positive silver clouds, so to say. So thanks for taking part. And I'm looking forward to your thoughts and your inspiration to get steps further. For it is what the ambassador was mentioning. We need to get it right. We are in a hurry. And I'm at your service. Thank you. So welcome everyone, I'm Gail Edmondson from Science Business, Editorial Director, and um, I'd like to just uh, remind everyone who's following this webcast that we are taking questions throughout the day, and there will be someone to pick them up if you send them via the chat function or uh, directly to live at sciencebusiness.net, live at sciencebusiness.net. So, Thank you very much for that rich overview of uh, the po possibilities of big data, uh, Vice President Cruz. Uh, I'm interested in how you might compare big data to the whole data mining sector. It, there seems to be a lot of interest and, and concern about regulation, which you mentioned. Data mining took off on, it on its own. It didn't need a lot of support from the policy side. What's different with big data and um, what's the key to unlocking the potential. We'll give you a minute to get your microphone on. There you go. Well, it's all about awareness uh, and taking um, the, the line that those who are um, involved in these issues are also taking the whole picture. So it's not only talking about data protection or about the new business models. It is about a combination, and that is the challenging issue that we are facing at the moment. So I'm rather optimistic, uh, we, but we need each other to make it clear where data protection indeed makes sense, and it doesn't make sense if you are only saying, I'm against, for that is not fitting in my business model. I just tempt you to be creative 
and when you are, for example, making uh, the data anonymous, then you can create whatever you, you plan in your business model. So it's not a block, it is not a barrier. So we should just take into account that it can be a positive issue and open data. I think that if we are not using it, we, we should be blamed and more than only be blamed. Are there some regions or countries that are on the leading edge of using uh, big data and are somehow grappling with these I issues of standardization and protection? Well, um, that is what I have in mind, a single market. And I'm not looking for, again, fragmentation, for it is now an opportunity to make it one single market for data. And of course, there are areas where you can see that on an individual base, leadership is taken and it is just implemented in a region. For example, with health and excellent examples can be made. But it's also in other areas where you can see that certain uh, issues are taken as a great example. And then we have to communicate that at the end of the day, the citizens are asking for it. Yes, the Research Data Alliance, I guess, has become a hotspot for communicating uh, the challenges, but also the solutions and some of the best practices that are going on. Uh, we'll hear more about that in a panel this afternoon. Uh, I'm wondering how competitive you think Europe is in big data vis-a-vis -vis other countries. U.S. Uh, President Obama is putting 200 million into big data R&D. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are for Europe, but are, are, is Europe... Um, keeping pace, and uh, what does it need to do to stay at the front line of this development? Um, we are absolutely aware that uh, investments need to be done. Uh, in Horizon 2020, there will be a yeah, part of uh, the budget available for this. Uh, we haven't yet uh, the blessing of all those institutions, council, parliament, uh, for that part, but I can assure you that we are in... Um, uh, one of uh, the driver seats uh, also talking about this. And I love competition and I always say uh, if our competitor is doing great, let's, let's uh, count our blessings for that is inspiring us too. So we can't afford to uh, keep on uh, the hindsight. And it is fascinating who uh, talking about uh, the global scene was really taking the lead, and we should learn from them. You um, have led the charge on the public sector information directive. It's about to be enacted. Uh, what are the benefits going to be, and how fast will they start streaming into the economy? Has anyone run a big data crunch on that? Number one, it will be voted for in uh, the next couple of weeks. So. Uh, that, that will be absolutely, yeah. And then it has to be implemented uh, on national levels. Um, I think that talking about this, arguments in, in favor are so strong that uh, it should be done. And it is not a matter of fear, it is a matter of challenge, and the sooner the better. For out of that, new business models can be taken, for example, uh, by those startups that I was touching upon. Do you believe big data is really going to make government more efficient and effective? Are there some Please. examples? <laughs> if such an easy instrument isn't taking what is really in, then I'm, I'm really yeah, getting in a, in a very sad mood. Um, it, it takes sometimes a bit more time, and also talking about ourselves in the Commission, but rocking the boat and just showing what is at the end of the day in for the citizen. And I do have the feeling that in the meantime, citizens are well informed and should get even more information what's in for them, and that it shouldn't be anymore a Minister of Finance who is saying, yes, but I, I badly need those um, uh, th those streams of finance uh, that I get from it, uh, that's not an argument that we should buy anymore. 
Okay. I'd like to uh, invite anyone who's in the audience to pose a question to Vice President Cruz. Um, have we got anyone who would like to pick up one of these themes? <coughs> Not at the moment. May yeah. I ask a question? Please. Well, what would you do if you were me? Um, the, there is no vacancy, but um, <laughs> um, what would you do if you were me? And then uh, talking about this issue. And your question, please. Right. Uh, my name is Irene. I'm a professor at the University of Warwick. My area of uh, expertise is in markets, so I'm not a technology person. The reason that you, you ask, um, what, would you, what would I do if I were you? The UK government has recently funded... This is not doing very well. Just change the microphone here. This one seems better. Sorry, Irene, can you start over? So it's better if it's bigger, is it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the UK government has recently funded a 1.2 million project, 1.2 million pound project, to a create a market at home so that individuals can exchange their data generated through the Internet of Things for products and services, in exchange for products and services. This project now goes live within the year, and it's believed that the market already concerned with privacy issues, will buy into this. Um, I'll get to my question, all right? The, the fact that... Um, no, your advice. Sorry? No, your advice for you, you are me. So you okay, okay, give right. <laughs> I am you, all right. Yep. The fact that individuals within this home environment will in the future be the generator, storer, owner of, of this data to give access rights to firms the other way around. And that this data is real, and it's not big data guesswork, uh, suggests to me that the future personal data economy may be much more balanced than it is currently. And in, since individuals will be holding the biggest repository of data well beyond the big data today, not Google or government or finance or health, and given that household consumption is 60% of the GDP in most, most countries, the multiplier effect of individual ownership and generator of data is huge. So I'm wondering, in a situation where all personal data is currently collected by organizations, um, giving rise to all these issues, is it a thing of the past? Because when the primary personal data outweighs and outnumber the secondary personal data out there, so we as Europe, I mean, can you please get your question. Okay, please. my question. This is Thank the question. You. So we as Europe, are we debating a policy that is the present of, or that of the future when we don't consider the markets for personal data economy? That is a fascinating remark slash question for I do agree that um, and I'm often in that mood that we are preparing legislation, regulation for a um, issue that you can nearby certain because also democracy takes quite a bit of time and it takes a couple of years to fulfill that the situation is completely changed when it is finalized. Therefore, I think with your legislation, you should be aware that it should be not only transparent and should be uh, effective, but that it also should be flexible in a way that you are not faced with a situation when it's taken over by member states, that it is out of date. And that is one of my big worries or uh, uh, things I, I, I'm faced with. <coughs> It is about credibility also talking about this area, but not only about this area. How can you keep credibility when people, and especially those who are highly involved in that new development, are thinking, my goodness, I'm just mentioning what I did before 
um, that um, if you allow me just make one remark, a personal remark, when I just took over this portfolio, I <coughs> uh, attended a campus party in Madrid uh, the first week, and uh, thousands Startups, uh, researchers, inventors were gathered, youngest 14 year old, eldest uh, 30. And I was sitting next to two 14 year old guys. There were, thanks heaven, also girls. But, and um, one of them was, and they had already started their own businesses, a couple of them, 14 years old. And they were explaining to each other what new invention they were busy with for a new company to start with. And I said to one, you are crazy. You are informing your competitor or your potential competitor. And he looked at me, and that was the wisest lesson, and that's connected with what you are mentioning. He said, Madame, you are old fashioned. It is just sharing and joining. And there you have to take into account that you get a better final result. And when you are talking about Internet of Things, that is already there. An Internet of Things will be the normal way, so to say. So we have to take that into account when we are making re um, regulations and so on. So what you are painting as a future, I imagine, is not that far away. And then we are in a different, uh, a different mindset. So flexibility in proposing and trying to tackle problems, yes, but also giving trust. And that is a bit finding balance for, I need people who are trusting all those new developments and not taking um, a, uh, an attitude where they say, I'm too old or I'm not trusting or I'm not, that can't be permitted for it is for everybody. I wanted to circle back to your request for advice. Now, would you like advice on what to do about data privacy and how to square that circle? Yes, or what, what, yeah. what exactly would you like advice on? Well, uh, whatever. It would be uh, very prestigious uh, to, to say only on this or only on that. But take into account that on data protection, there is a proposal. It is dealt with in Parliament now. 3,000 amendments are made by members of parliament. So quite a bit of your lobby has resulted in, um, in proposals. So we have to take into account. But for me, main talking about that issue is um, how can we fill in our joint and shared responsibility? For it is also taking a creative attitude in getting opportunities for those new mo business models you are interested in. Okay, I think we have someone in the back. Yes, again, please state your name and your institution, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Professor Linson from the MNRC New Phone Network. Um, you are asking uh, for advice. Uh, allow me to give perhaps you some advice. Uh, the MNRC is the Neuroscience Research Center interested in the education of tomorrow. Um, one of the most complex challenges of today is integration. Um, there is a general consensus regarding interdisciplinarity, but we are still light years away from integrating interdisciplinarity. Uh, the existing educational system is not sufficiently powerful to enable us to deal with the complexities of the challenges we are faced with. We must turn to the education of tomorrow, integrated interdisciplinarity. And this means not capacity building, but new capacity building, going beyond accumulation to integration. This means optimizing the mindset or the state of mind for complex, avant-garde, integrated, interdisciplinary challenge processing. Thank you. This is what we are doing, working on. Thank you. <laughs> Give me your card, uh, please, afterwards. Uh, yeah? I ran out of cards. Uh, give, uh, give me your email or whatever. OK, we've got a few more minutes. Has anyone else got a question for the vice president? Or advice? Uh, yes, I please state your name and your question, please. Thank you. Adam Heathfield from Pfizer. Um, I suppose I had a question which was about quality of data. And I think quantity in many sectors is seen as a way of bypassing quality issues. So if we aggregate data, more and more data, we somehow 
can forget the need to generate very high quality data. And I'm just wondering how that tension is playing out when you see competition, expansion, increasing access. Are there enough incentives to continue to generate really high quality data where that's needed, rather than just generating more and more and hoping statistics is our savior? Fascinating issue, and I'm tempted to uh, get into it. For, of course, we should give an eye to quality for at, at the longer term, uh, and already tomorrow or today, it is of, of main importance. But I don't want to interfere too much in uh, market uh, responsibilities. And I am a strong believer in the functioning of a market, that uh, at the end of the day, if it's not quality, then you will see that there is less, um, uh, less interest, so to say. But it is also talking about how you just present your data and what time of perspectives are you connecting with it. But again, that is not for commission or for governments, it is for just in my opinion, the market, and of course rules, that there are also lines of behaving and conduct and so on. But in general, I think we need to be very modest in that. By the way, when the former, um, the predecessor uh, mentioned education and um, skills and what we need, I'm highly impressed by what is at stake talking about, and highly impressed, feeling sad by the figures of the youth unemployment in Europe. In my opinion, it's absolutely unacceptable that in certain member states there are figures of 60% youth unemployed. And, and perhaps you think, but that was not on the agenda this afternoon. In a way, it is for you are talking about no perspective for a generation, and then it's easy to say, so a lost generation. If we are able, and with the grand coalition, and I'm grateful to all those companies in this field uh, who are active in that, in the grand coalition, we are combining our efforts to give more opportunities and to give more educational uh, opportunities, to give them skills where, and that is the positive part of it, where now you see that those research uh, and um, innovation activities of uh, certain important companies are also moving to those countries where the talent is there for quite often the talent of the youngsters is there but there is no job and if those uh, companies are moving their research and innovation or a part of that to those countries, it is um, solving two problems. Their problem of supply and demand that's not in balance, and uh, in such a country, just push uh, that type of activities and get a new um, a movement, so to say. And all in all, I think if our youngsters are talented, and they are, but they, they need to have also the skills and when you can find out what type of skill is really needed uh, then and I'm not only talking about engineers and so on but I'm talking all uh, through the chain then we can do a good job and we are not losing. Yeah there's a huge demand for um, talent in this sector and we'll have to do a lot to prepare for the next generation. Uh, we're running short of time if anyone has a very short question promise a last question from the back. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Pieper from NXP Semiconductors. So uh, when you access data, uh, you can arrange a lot through legislation. So uh, what is publicly available, what is highly secure data, uh, what is the authentication to have access to the data. So on one hand you have legislation, on the other hand you have technologies, like we are working upon this. So what is your view on the combination of legislation, technology, and how should they work together to make sure that the right data is accessible to the right people? Communication and cooperation, for otherwise you are losing opportunities. And what we are doing is trying to get together also in our funding systems 
trying to get together all those parties involved. So what you are mentioning, trying to get on a, a company level, on a, a regional and a national level, and of course research and uh, universities and the commission. So uh, we're going to move on to the next part of the program. I want to thank Vice President Cruz for her uh, insights and uh, dialogue. Uh, it's obviously the beginning of a very long one, which um, has lots of interesting twists and turns ahead. We will produce a report from this event, and you'll certainly be getting uh, feedback from a number of the participants. So thank you again. and.